uh, either that toxin or that uh, virus. So opsonization would be another function that the antibodies can induce. So they can bind to the pathogen and then this is then the um, antibody bound to that antigen will bind to an FC receptor on a phagocytic cell and then that whole antibody and antigen um, bound to the FC receptor is going to be internalized and then broken down and destroyed. So um, again, remember the antibodies, uh, FC receptors will, so here's our variable region of our antibody that binds to an antigen and I guess this will, will have the green being our antigen. But then we have a, the constant regions that are the same, so they're not variable, and that's what's going to bind to an FC receptor. So this FC receptor will then bind, it'll recognize non-specifically just uh, a um, certain isotype, a certain constant region, it'll bind to that, and then it will trigger a signal into the cell to internalize that entire um, complex and, and chew it up. Um, complement, we've talked about, we had a whole chapter where we talked about complement. How, um, again, you have antibodies bound to the surface of something, they will bring in these complement, that so complement is floating around, um, that C3 will bind and then it'll, it'll create that complement of um, of proteins that bind and punch a hole in the cell and eventually will induce um, the cell death. So you have complement fixation and then you have um, antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. And so this is what is going to be induced by um, majorly NK cells. So NK cells um, are going to have an FC receptor on them, but NK cells aren't. Um, phagocytic cells. They're small they, and when we look at them in a microscope you really can't differentiate the NK cells from lymph other lymphocytes. Okay, so they're very similar to, they look like a lot like T cells and T cells aren't going around phagocytosing things because they're kind of small. But these NK cells have FC receptors on them and so when they bind through that FC receptor it's very much like uh, T cell binding to its cognate antigen MHC complex and then signaling to for it to kill that cell. So the NK cells will also basically look around for antibodies bound to cells. If they find that they will induce cytotoxicity of that cell and that functions through an FC receptor. So that's one way an NK cell can work. Um, when we get through antibodies, we'll, there's another way NK cells function as well. So NK cells not only will target cells that are bound to antibody, but they're going to target um, cells that don't have uh, MHC expression, and we'll talk about why that is. So antibodies mediate the clearance of these destructive pathogens in a variety of ways, just as we described, um, neutralization where the you guys aren't seeing what I'm showing here, laser pointer. So you've got viruses and toxins that neutralize, um, that are neutralized because the antibody binds to them and they can't um, bind to the host. Um, you've got opsonization where again that FC receptor binds to the constant region of antibodies that are bound. So again, remember those antibodies when they bind to something, they change conformation. That constant region changes its shape just enough to where now it can bind to FC receptors. Um, if it's just floating around and it's not bound to anything, it won't bind to the FC receptor to induce um, opsonization. Uh, the other is complement, so if they are bound again to a cell, that conformation changes to where they can bind to the complement system and create that um, MAC complex that's going to allow cells to uh, basically um, undergo um, lysis. And then the other is this NK induced. So we have NK cells that have FC receptors just like the macrophages but instead of um, phagocytosing the target they are going to, uh, and in this case the target's the same size as the NK cell so it's not going to phagocytose it. 
it's going to um, induce cytotoxicity. It's going to uh, actually send a signal to the cell telling it to kill itself. So antibodies, there's different isotypes. We've got our... What? This signal what? To kill a cell? Yep. No, so, okay. so that, yeah, that, that the NK cell is going to signal, uh, send an apoptotic signal. But we're going to cover that um, at the end of this um, this uh, lecture. So IgEs who come in, our, our immunoglobulins come in different uh, flavors. They have different constant regions. We have our IgEs and we have a, ver a variety of different IgGs. We have our IgAs and we have our IgMs. Again, remember IgM and IgD are the, the first IgEs that are expressed on these naive cells, these immature cells. Um, IgD will signal, kind of send that survival signal. IgM will then be the predominant and it will be expressed on the cell surface of these cells as they, they go out, these naive cells. But then you're going to get class switching and you're going to shift to one of these other isotypes. Um, again, remember IgM. Um, here we're showing molecular weight um, at very large because IgM is um, very large uh, pentamers and um, so IgM can form a pentamer. Again, in IgA, let's see, IgA can form dimers, um, trimers it can form so the dominant form of IgA would be a dimer, so it can be anywhere between a, a, a single molecule or dimerized molecule or trimer. Um, so, but for the most part, these other secreted antibodies, IgEs, are not going to um, create dimers or, or pentamers. Um, and they're found, this is just telling you at what level they're found in the serum. So the majority of our IgEs are Ig1. IgG1, um, IgG2 would be the next most abundant you would find in, in serum. And then um, kind of coming down from there and um, IgAs, okay, IgM, and then really very low numbers of IgE, which is good because IgE is associated with um, allergic reactions. Is IgE the lowest Yes. <coughs> So it's good to know who's, you know, kind of if you were to say, well, what do I need to memorize here? It's good, always good to know who's the most and who's the least and, um, and kind of who is, forms pentamers, who forms dimers, um, so th that's, and who's the monomers. So um, half-lives kind of shows the half-lives of them. Um, it's a nice little chart and kind of shows that they all have different um, properties and a little bit different function. Uh, and if you don't have, and we've looked at, to study the function of these different isotypes, the importance of them, uh, we've studied them in knockout mice to say, okay, well, what if, what if I have plenty of IgEs, but I don't have IgA? So you see increase in respiratory infections, um, and, and you, you look at where is IgA, where do we find our IgAs, they are secreted into, um, they're, in sec they're secreted, um, they're coating epithelial cells, and so they, you could kind of think of them as first responders and kind of sitting there coating surfaces that are going to be in contact with our environment. So you kind of can see where is this, where are these localized, what is their function, and we can also look at knockout mice and say if we get rid of this, what do you see, and you, you know, in the case of like IgA, for example, you see increased infect respiratory infections, um, things like that. So um, antibodies, uh, again, will a major component of how antibodies are um, targeted is through that FC receptor and we can see that FC receptor binding can cause things like degranulation. So for example, eosinophils aren't going to engulf that helminth, that large worm, but binding will create, now they will degranulate and create a very, 
um, nasty environment for that worm to live in. So again, this is triggered through the FC receptor binding to the antibodies bound to that worm. So the function of FC receptor could be, for example, degranulation of eosinophils. And these um, are targeted, these are triggered by IgEs. So again, um, IgE is associated with allergic reactions. Um, it's why you sneeze when you have an allergen come into your nose. So um, even though IgEs have some negative uh, deleterious effects, um, they cause an inflammation, they cause swelling, uh, they secrete histamines, they're, you know, they're pretty, pretty nasty, but evolutionarily they do uh, help to get rid of very large things like helmets, um, allergens that come in that could coat the respiratory tract, for example, that could be, that could be damaging to us. Um, these will be secreted, they will cause um, swelling in the area, they cause our um, blood vessels to dilate and so you basically you're starting to flush out, um, trying to flush out, you, they cause sneezing, they cause itchiness, so they cause you to try and get rid of, of that, that pathogen or that allergen. Um, you can also have Again, FC receptors, as we mentioned, can induce opsonization, so the uptake, so um, the, the isotypes that are involved with that um, would be your IgAs and IgGs. So IgAs are kind of sitting at the surface of most of the lining epithelial cells. They're secreted. You can find them in um, saliva, um, breast milk. You can find them in tears, uh, so these Igs will, will be in a lot of our secretions and the IgAs, whereas the IgGs are gonna be the major one found in our serum um, and circulating. And then the other thing is how uh, FC receptors also help to recirculate um, antibodies that are, for example, once an antibody is uh, under cytose, it can be then returned to the serum. So they help maintain serum levels of antibodies by recycling those antibodies. Um, and then the other function of these FC receptors in conjunction with NK cells, antigen-dependent cell toxicity known as ADC, cell, and then again we got this gated, so the M is in there mediated cytotoxicity. So the, they function as a receptor um, on NK cells, in effect turning them into, um, giving them a specific response against anything that uh, has an antibody bound to it. So these um, function, and these are gonna function through your IgGs. And then we have um, transcytosis into secretion. So the FC receptors also play a role in helping to secrete um, IgAs into the secretion. So that's, that's your IgAs and also IgMs um, can, can function through that, that system. So they, um, antibody IC types mediate different effector functions here. We, we're just gonna go over um, IgM is going to be that first antibody produced in a primary response because we haven't undergone class switch. And remember when those B cells we just covered yesterday uh, see their cognate antigen, they will then take two paths. They'll either, or either start right there and then start to produce plasma cells which are going to have IgM or they're going to go and create those germinal centers and class switch and have IgGs or uh, depending on the cytokines in that in that um, reaction, are going to decide which which Ig do I need to to produce. But the first responder is always IgM. The secreted form is going to be that pentameric form. Um, so these tend to be lower affinity because they haven't undergone what? Maturation. Well, they haven't undergone a maturation, but what's the next process that happens in those germinal centers other than class switching, before class switching? Um, somatic hypermutation. Yeah, somatic hypermutation. So they haven't undergone somatic hypermutation. They have better affinity than a T cell receptor, but they haven't really selected for that real high affinity um, antibody. So they tend to be lower affinity. 
but um, they are lower affinity, but because there's a pentamer, so there's more sites, so they're low affinity, but they can be high what if they have more binding sites? Avidity. avidity. So these are higher avidity because, and so they probably kind of evolved um, to, to have more binding sites because they are lower affinity. And so by having more sites to bind, we increase their avidity. Um, pentavalent, 10 total antigens of binding sites, very good at complement fixation. Um, lead to MAC formation, and to, so they, they work into um, the complement very well. Um, they also form these dense, so agglutination is induced by IgM, so uh, the term agglutination, for example, when we're doing blood typing, right? And you take blood and you mix it with a, an anti-A or anti-B and you look and you stir it around and you look for that agglutination, that's what these IgMs are doing because they have, they're basically going to be this, you know, have targets going off like this so they can bind to this guy and this guy and this guy and then have another one bound to, so they make these large complexes that can now be removed, be neutralized. Um, and so um, if you want to know what your Anti A's and B's, and these are these are M. These are going to be IgM antibodies that they use in that process. Um, then the next is IgG. Once we've undergone class switching, one of the major ones that's going to the the, the predominant uh, isotype is going to be IgG, and this is the one that's found in, in the most abundance in the serum. This is not a pentamer. This is found as a monomer. It includes several. Subclasses, so there's IgG ones, twos, threes. Um, human IgG one and IgG three um, are effective at complement fixation, as um, and IgG one, whereas now we need this uh, antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity, whereas IgG one from humans are what mediate that. Um, and all variants bind to, all of these will bind to F receptors and have seen cytosexosis by macrophages. IgAs, so again, um, I expect you guys to know what are the different isotypes and what are the main, and these are the major, you know, just I've highlighted just the major um, functions of each. Um, this is the major isotype found in secretion, so that's what you need to know about IgAs. Is there going to be the major secreted antibody? You find them in the mucus in the gut, milk and mammary glands, tears, saliva. Um, they're effective at neutralizing toxins and pathogens. So they're, they're, they're those first responders that will block entry or, or help to um, neutralize things before they even get in. Um, does not fix complement, so it does not drive inflammation, which is probably good because again when we're breathing things in we don't want to constantly induce inflammation we just want to stop things from entering okay um, long half-life and secretions uh, due to protease resistant amino acid sequences in the acid. so these are very long lived in these secretions which is important so IgEs are best known for their role in allergy and asthma which is not good but they also play a role in protection against parasitic Worms and protozoa, so very large things. Um, so they are they are important. They do um, not having them could be um, have negative effects. Um, even though they do have ne they can also have negative effects by having too much of them. Um, they're made in very small quantities and should be, um, but induce really potent effects by degranulation of eosinophil and basophils. Again. That's creating an environment. So when you have like a pussy environment, that's kind of those eosinophils are secreting, or they're, they're just throwing out um, lysosomes. They are really creating, um, there's a lot of histamines. And that's why when you, that's why um, to help reduce the inflammation, reduce those symptoms, you take those antihistamines, um, epinephrine, is, and histamines are actually also a neurotransmitter and the 
Opposite of those would be adrenaline or norepinephrine, and so you could, um, those EpiPens, you would, if you had a severe allergic reaction, that EpiPen, it's going to negate those histamines and so help to prevent um, basically you um, having too much of an allergic reaction where all the blood vessels are dilating, you're, you're getting fluid in your lungs, you're, you're drowning because you, you just have too many histamines. So um, epinephrine can block that, uh, antihistamines also block that to Benadryl, um, things like that. Um, so we, those are the different isotypes and their main function. We also have different FC receptors that also have different functions. Um, they um, come in different uh, sizes, but um, here the majority of these, and you can see some have signaling through ITAM. Um, one of them, the FC gamma receptor 2, actually has inhibitory function, so it has ITAMs. So whereas these ITAMs, when, when this FC receptor will bind, it will then couple um, just like uh, T cell or B cell receptor binding will then, uh, they'll dimerize, they'll go into lipid rafts, they'll cause signaling, they'll, the, these ITAMs will get phosphorylated. So what the ITAM is doing is if that guy binds, he will start to dephosphorylate, so turn off that. So it works in conjunction with this. It, it's a lower affinity and these inhibitory FC receptors will actually um, help to, they're kind of like, um, when T cells get up, active, up, up, they have positive co-stimulation, then they upregulate their negative co-stimulatory molecules. This is kind of that one check in this system to help prevent over uh, expression of, of antibodies if you have plenty in the area already. So we have both um, signals that will uh, induce. How do we remember all these stuff? Do they have different functions or they do have different functions. So like with this chart here, uh, you have FC gamma receptor one. Uh, it's, it also has a CD mark, uh, a CD associated with it, CD64. Um, you don't have to memorize all the cells that it's associated with, but you, you can see that they are oftentimes expressed on not only dendritic cells and monocytes, but also B cells. Um, what do we, we need to know about it. Um, so you, you need to know what what, what um, the function of different FC receptors. So FC receptor one is involved in phagocytosis, cell activation. This FC um, gamma receptor two is really important to know that it's the only. It's this inhibitory receptor. It um, it traps antigen antibody complexes. So um, these F FC receptors are binding to antigen antibody complexes and they're signaling for phagocytosis. These guys, when they bind to that complex, they are, um, tend to be in germinal centers and they abrogate B cell activation. So they will, they're also lower affinity, so they, um, you have to have more antibody around. So basically they function by um, competing with um, other FC receptors that are also on. And if you look at these guys, um, so FC receptor gamma, FC gamma receptor one is on B cells, but also FC gamma two is on B cells. So these both are expressed, one has a positive, so one ha is a, um, it will activate the cell, and one will turn off the cell. And the one that turns off is the lower, of a lower affinity, and so basically, if you have a little bit of that, that uh, antigen binding to it, the, the positive signal wins out. But if you have a lot of that antigen, the negative signal will then take over. So it's kind of this, this balance between how much antigen antibody complex do I have? Do I have a little bit? Okay, I'll probably be getting positive signal through FC gamma receptor one. If I have a lot, then I'm going to now start to um, bind more and more FC gamma receptor 2 and start to get a negative signal and shut down uh, B cell activation. So FC gamma receptor 3 is then involved in that antibody directed um, cytotoxicity by NK cells. So again, major things to remember, FC receptor 1 is on, on B cells and it has a positive, it induces phagocytosis. 
FC gamma receptor 2 is inhibitory, also on B cells. FC gamma receptor 3 is what's involved in inducing. It's what you're going to find on NK cells and other cells that's going to induce cytotoxicity. It's not going to be phagocytic. Um, FC gamma receptor 4 also involved in AD. So these two you could kind of lump together. Um, so FC epsilon uh, receptor 1 is involved in degranulation. So you can see these all, instead of phagocytosis, this is on eosinophils, basophils, mast cells. These are going to induce um, secretions of um, basically degranulation into that area causing an inflammatory environment. Um, so that's kind of, I would just go through and kind of remember what are the different major functions of each of the different FC receptors. Um, again, you don't have to memorize this, but how the FC receptors signal is very, uh, it's just very, very similar to how B cell receptors will signal. Um, they, they have ITAM, ITAMs, these will dimerize FC receptors when they, they will, when they bind to their, the antibodies. They will then dimerize, they will localize to a region where they can become activated, so they associate with this SYK. That will then phosphorylate ITAMs. They'll also associate with these other factors and basically downstream um, upregulate IP3s and cause calcium um, secretion um, uh, release and activation. So basically the same pathway, very similar pathway. So they have, you can kind of see that they've evolved um, probably from a common progenitor, um, so that's that, FC receptors. Um, and so here's where we just go over FC gamma receptors are most diverse. So again, as you saw, there was FC gamma receptor 1s, 2s were inhibitory, 3s and 4s were in, so there, there's, this is the most diverse group of FC receptors. Um, the main mediator of antibody functions in the body, and they're expressed, as you saw, on a wide range of cells, and most are activating except for one which is inhibitory. Um, they'll induce phagocytosis and degranulation. FC alpha receptors are expressed by major those myeloid cells, the monocytes, macrophages, granulocytes, dendritic cells. Um, they contribute to um, ADCC, and phagocytosis um, and uh, stimulate myeloid cells to release the inflammatory cytokines. FC epsilon receptors are expressed mainly in um, basophils, eosinophils, and they are uh, cause degranulation. And you don't have to memorize the two different types. So it, when you focus on these, just tell me what the FC uh, epsilon receptors are majorly involved in. Uh, you do need to know FC um, receptor, FC gamma receptors. Uh, what's the difference between like one and two? Um, so, and then we have um, PLG receptors. These are those polymeric immunoglobulin receptors expressed by epithelial cells, and these initiate transport. So when we go back and we look at uh, the, these are those that are going to help transport the IgAs and Ms um, from the blood into the lumen, the inside of the multiple tissues, and into the gastrointestinal tract. So these are the guys that help to uh, move the IgAs once they're made um, onto the surface of epithelial cells into secretions. So these are, these are important to know that these are the, those, the effectors that affect that um, localization of the IgAs. Um, and then we have this neonatal FC receptor. Um, there's a neonatal, uh, a neonatal FC receptor. It's um, related to MHC class one, expressed on lots of different cells, um, the, all throughout your lifespan. Um, epithelial, endothelial cells uh, helps to this uh, function, <clears throat> as you might guess, helps to carry antibody ingested in milk across the epithelial cells. So these are really important early in life when um, infants have n are not producing antibodies yet. They're, they have not become educated. 
as to what's in their environment. They haven't under they haven't built up any type of memory. So these are what help to move um, antibodies from the mother um, across the epithelial cells into the bloodstream of infants. Um, these um, neonatal FC receptors. Um, let me see where we're at. Okay, we're making good time. Uh, visualizing antibodies um, and FC uh, effector responses. Um, so let's see, FC effector functions. Um, so B cells can encounter antigen bind to it, become activated after receiving T cell help. They differentiate into antibody screening plasma cells, and we've covered this already. And then these plasma cells, as this is just reviewing, um, they can either then, uh, the antibodies will bind and induce opsonization, uh, activate, activate the complement cascade. So this is important to kind of memorize this, this, this sequence of events, enhance inflammation activation of neutrophils so they then induce um, release of um, those uh, lytic uh, vesicles, they recruit cytotoxic T cells and also help to activate NK cells for this ADCC killing, which is really important. Um, so now cytotoxicity. So that's, that's what, now, now we're going to the more cell-mediated uh, arm, uh, cell-mediated effector response. So now covering cytotoxic T cells. Um, some of the, the, the cells that mediate cytotoxicity are going to be our cytotoxic T cells, the CD8 T cells, also NK T cells, um, and we talked about one of the, the ways NK cell or N, N, NK cells. So NK T cells are kind of an in between the CTL and the NK cell, in that they kind of resemble NK cells a little bit more, but then they have a T cell receptor. And again, we I mentioned briefly that these NK T cells um, do not have they have this invariant T cell receptor that is more of an innate type receptor and in that it recognizes um, key uh, components of pathogens. So it doesn't have this huge array of different T cell receptors like uh, CTL have, our cytotoxic T lymphocytes, but it, um, so it kind of is the, the um, link in between innate and adaptive immunity. Um, and then you can see here that CTLs will kill through two different, they'll, they'll not only secrete interferon gamma, TNF, but they're going to kill through FAS and FAS ligand, or they're going to kill through perforins and granzyme. So there are two major ways of targeting a cell for apoptosis is through perforins and granzymes or this FAS-FAS ligand interaction. And you can see the NK cells are identical. So NK cells are going to kill the same way that cytotoxic T cells do, they just target cells a little differently. And these NKT cells, you can see that they also induce things like interferon gamma, which it has antiviral effects. Um, IL-4, IL-4 is, again, remember IL-4 is gonna induce, it's a helper cytokine for driving B cells to um, class switch, it's driving B cells to become, um, start secreting IgGs, so again, um, GMCSF, IL-2, um, TNF. So these guys um, also will have, um, and then they will also kill through FAS and FAS what ligand. What is GMCSF? GM uh, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. You don't need to memorize that. It's, it's, um, it's just a uh, kind of a chemokine that will then create an inflammatory environment and bring cells to that, um, to that environment. It'll um, kind of uh, call in dendritic cells, things like that. So that's mean they just bring Yeah, so well, then they also can kill through fast. So they're gonna create an inflammatory environment. Interferon gamma can have a direct effect on an antiviral effect. Uh, they're driving, so, uh, this is kind of a good good thing to kind of memorize. So um, cytotoxic effector cells, they have these three subsets that I just went over, and they each kill slightly different killing mechanism and trigger, but each induces apoptosis. And again, um, we'll talk about uh, how do they, they, they basically, these cells uh, 
Um, they don't, even though we call them cytotoxic, and we used to think that they, they directly killed cells, but now we've come to find that they actually will induce, they will drive a, a very um, strong uh, reaction within those cells that now induces apoptosis. So they kind of convince the, the what pe how people describe it is they come up to that cell and they convince it to commit suicide. So, so this uh, purpurin mm -hmm. and granzyme. 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 Yes. Uh, so I know that one is uh, you know the fast pill is apoptosis. Mm -hmm. So purpurin and, uh, purpurin and granzyme also induce apoptosis. It does punch a hole in cells, but that doesn't kill them like the MAC complex. It doesn't function the same way. And we used to think that's, so that maybe 10 years ago, we probably used to think that way, but they actually won't kill cells. So just um, by punching cells, so for example, if I have a T cell and I knock out granzyme, it won't kill the cell. It'll punch holes in the cell, but that cell won't die. It'll continue. It, once it decouples with that T cell, it'll go on and it'll, it'll survive. So that, in effect, isn't killing the cell. Also, um, the granzyme itself is not killing the cell, but is inducing. Um, it's the, it's actually has the granzyme has, and we'll, we'll have a slide about that. Has um, a protease effect where it will now induce that, that pathway, cath that caspase. Again, remember we talked about apoptosis and how that caspase pathway. If you once you activate that and now release, huh? Um, caspase eight. Yeah. So we'll we'll I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so we'll get to that in just a second. But first, let's just look at both. So what happens? Um, CTLs recognize and kill infected. They can infected cells, uh, tumor cells via their TCR. Um, and so effector CTL generation, We again, remember, we have signal one and TCRs bind to peptide presented by an APC. Um, they, recognize uh, AP, they recognize that antigen presented via MHC class one. Um, they recognize it best in the context of co-stimulatory signal, um, so that they're going to receive from this APC. So they're not just going to go around and, and first come into contact with antigen or a viral antigen or a tumor antigen, they have to become, they have to see it in context of that antigen presenting cell so they can get that co-stimulatory signal. And then um, they'll also get help. So on that same antigen presenting cell, it will express MHC class two. But remember, once those T cells, once those CD4s bind to MHC class two, they will actually induce, um, they will direct that cell to start to process exogenous antigen and present it via MHC class one. So this cross presentation pathway, and then they can actually bind to CD8s now and activate them. So now you've got these naive CD8s that have become mature or activated. Um, and so then those will become cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So now these will now go out and look for cells that are also expressing this MHC antigen complex. So for, remember, we, to get to CTL, we have to go through this complex kind of um, checks and balance system. So, you had a question about this? Yeah, this is a complex. So you said it's a cross? So cross presentation is when you have an antigen presenting cell which, yep, like a dendritic cell, okay. um, because dendritic cells are really the major players in cross presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so that dendritic cell uh, expresses an antigen via MHC class two. It stimulates helper cells, so CD4s, and then those CD4s will signal through that dendritic cell that induces cross the cross presentation pathway. So the exogenous antigen. So remember, normally endogenous antigens are presented via MHC class one. Yeah. But in this case, it's actually allowing that dendritic cell to now start to um, basically direct exogenous antigens through the proteasome into the ER. They'll bind to MHC class one and be presented via MHC class one. So now, so class one, they will drive exogenous antigens to be presented via class one, and that's called cross presentation. Yeah. 
The other thing we don't cover in the book is cross-dressing, which is if a dendritic cell were to, if there was damage in an area and cells were to die and get chewed up, that dendritic cell can present MHC class one already bound to antigen on its cell surface. It just happens to be from another cell. So this, when you say that it's not an antigen, does it can be from a virus, from bacteria? It could be. It could be from anything. But anything that it, that that. Um, so that's why it's important that if you have an inflama inflammation, if you have tissue damage, if you have anything that, any innate cell that induces inflammation, one of the key factors of an inflammatory environment is to bring dendritic cells into the area. Once you've brought dendritic cells into the area, any cells that have been lysed or killed or have died because they, they popped open will then release antigen into the area. Dendritic cells pick that up and then will start to present it. They should not only they present in a uh, MHC class two, right? Yes, normally. Normally, but this is. But once they receive help, then they'll start to present it via MHC class one. Once you receive help, that means from CD4 signal. Mm-hmm. So the CD4s you? will signal in through the dendritic cell, so they will send that reverse signal into the dendritic cell, and that signal will now induce those exogenous exogenous antigens to be uh, basically shuttled through the um, proteasome into the ER, into the rough ER, then they'll be loaded onto MHC class one and presented via MHC class one to cytotoxic T cells. And so then those cytotoxic T cells will now become activated and now will start to look and go out and circulate throughout the body and look for its target that it now knows it needs to go and find and kill. Um, so the importance of cross-presentation and CTL activation, um, best, the best CTL activation is achieved uh, when antigen-presenting cells used can present peptides in both, the, both types of MHC molecules. Uh, again, not all cells can do that, only dendritic cells. Um, cross-presentation allows dendritic cells to acquire antigen from non-antigen-presenting cells and present them on both uh, MHC class one and class two. And this solves the problem, providing the best um, stimulation for CTL activation. Um, so just like we had TH1s and TH2s, there are uh, TC1s, so cyto T type 1 cytotoxic T cells and type 2 cytotoxic T cells. Um, TC1 oh, but not IL-4 uh, can use perforin and fast-mediated death induction. Um, TC2s are differentiate in the presence of IL-4, drive more of uh, antibody response. So they appear um, to only use perforin. These guys, TC2s only use uh, perforin uh, death induction strategies, not fast fast ligands. Um, and so similar to TH1s um, in that TC1s are going to be dodging regions more so than TC2s. And then, um, and so how, how have we, we, we studied, um, how have we followed, where do these CTLs go once they become activated? Because really what happens, the sequence of event is you have an infection. Um, it becomes inflammatory due to our innate response, our initial innate response due to tissue damage, due to um, maybe a pathogen um, is, is uh, PRR recognizes that pathogen from one of our innate cells and we create, uh, we call out to all the dendritic cells in the area to come in. They pick up antigen, and then once they pick up antigen, they will traffic to lymph nodes. They activate, they cross-present antigen. They activate C CD4, CD8s, and then those CD8s. So we only know this because we've actually followed um, what happens when we um, cause an infection. So how we do that is we have this, what they call tetramer technology. So um, basically what that is, and this has changed a lot, pentamers are actually more used nowadays, but um, when this book was published, it was probably tetramers. Um, they basically, we have um, antibodies that bind to MHC molecules, and then these MHC molecules will bind to antigens, and we have this fluorescent um, marker um, that allows us to now stain for, for these cells. So 
they took basically a mouse and sectioned all the organs out and looked in them to see, um, basically look for CD8s that bind to a specific MHC antigen combination. So you use a needle magnet and streptavidin and not. Well, streptavidin um, will then you can then cause streptavidin will bind to its target and then that's going to be a fluorescent marker. So uh, that's not really important because. Um, in this case, they're showing streptavidin, but in a lot of other cases, they'll just use um, a, a fluorescent. Um, so they just use the streptavidin to, pull to bind. The to, no, they're actually using streptavidin as a target for a fluorochrome. So, yeah. So streptavidin here is just, um, they're showing it as, as your fluorochrome, even though that's a, not really what's happening. Um, so, yeah. What's the purpose of this? So the purpose of this is to just basically have a fluorescently labeled um, MHC antibody, or MHC antigen complex that will then now allow you to look through the, the entire system. So they took this mouse, and they basically, um, they infected it with uh, SVV or some other um, viral antigen, and then they followed it looking for, they knew they had an antigen that they knew was SVV antigen via MHC, and they used this tetramer to stain basically all the tissues and say, well, where are these? And you can kind of see that um, the CD8s, the cytotoxic T cells, uh, you no longer find them in lymph nodes, so very few are actually in lymph nodes, um, but you find them pretty heavily in all of the organs. So all this is just to so show you. you. Localize how much, uh, how much of this whatever you get uh, is anything. Where does they go? Where does the anti? Yeah. So in this case, they're actually just sectioning tissues and then staining for looking for um, T cells. A T cell. Yeah. So that's what the tetramer does. The tetramer stains T cells, basically. It will bind to the T cell receptor. So it's just kind of a reverse of an antibody. Instead of using an antibody fluorochrome, you use an MHC molecule bound to an antigen as your, this is now your. So that's MHC This is MHC class one. So we're looking for CD8s, remember? Um, so if we follow, this is just following CD8, so tracking CD8 or CTLs uh, with uh, tetramers. So it's, it's good to know the kind of uh, some of the techniques involved in how we've, we've come to, to um, know what's going on in the, the whole immune response. Um, and this is just to show you that, um, again, in the mesenteric lymph nodes, peripheral lymph nodes, very actual low levels of these CD8s are found whereas they're found pretty highly in the different organs. Whereas if we were to look at that same mouse without that infection, you would probably find more of those CD8s in the lymph nodes um, than you would find in the periphery. So basically what happens is those CD8s get activated in lymph nodes and then they basically rapidly move from the lymph nodes into the periphery, they move into the organs and they, you can see they go everywhere. So um, it's a pretty prolific response and will basically look around. It basically, they will traffic through the entire body looking for um, that virus or looking for cells infected with that virus, basically. Um, so what happens when they find a cell? Uh, their, their CTL, their, so their T cell receptor will bind to MHC. That cell will be making, inside of that cell, it's making that virus or it's making, or it's a tumor cell that's making some, some messed up protein because those tumor cells have been dividing like mad, had a lot of mutagenesis going on. And so they're, they're making things that are a target for that CTL. And so that CTL sees that cell now. It's an activated, this is no longer a naive CD8. This is an active cytotoxic T cell. It recognizes antigen MHC complex. It will now signal through to the cell and it will then, um, these mitotic um, centers then will drive, basically they will um, bind through uh, these um, ICAM and LFA. So again, remember ICAM and LFAs, these are um, going to stick together. These are adhesion molecules. And so 
uh, once a cell sees antigen, it's actually going to signal through that T cell receptor and actually going to change the affinity of the LFA1 and it's going to change it to this high affinity LFA1. So this low affinity LFA1 is on T cells that haven't seen antigen and it's kind of bent over and it won't bind to ICAM. So all of our cells are going to have these ICAMs, these adhesion molecules on them. And once it sees antigen, then it's going to basically target and drive that high affinity um, LFA1, which will now bind to ICAM very strongly. So it changes the affinity incredibly to where these now will now stick to the cells. And so they stick together. But this is very, this high affinity form is very short lived. So what that allows it to do is it's called the kiss of death. These cells come together. If it signals through TCR, it causes that high affinity LFA1 to now stick to the ICAMs on the cell surface of that target cell. It sticks very closely in close proximity for about five minutes. It releases its payload of perforins and granzymes or it signals through fast, fast ligand. And then after about five minutes, it releases and that cell undergoes apoptosis. Um, here we can see that when, if we're comparing um, binding, so they um, CTL bound to ICAM1 coated wells, so they coated wells with this ICAM1, and then they look to see how well cells stuck, and if the cell CTLs were not activated, they didn't stick very well, um, but if they were to activate those CTLs, so they activated with the anti-CD3, again this is important to know that anti-CD3, remember CD3 is, um, forms that TCR complex when TC, T cell receptors are bound. And so when you have an antibody that binds to anti -CD, binds to CD3, it will, it will basically pull those CD3, that complex together and signal through it regardless. It, you don't have to have MHC antigen. So it's just turning, basically it's a way to turn on a T cell receptor. And so they, they turn on all the T cell receptors, signal through them, and then they bind those cells and they can see that they really bind very strongly. So, so this is just like in a test tube, they just yes. CD3, whatever, risk. Yeah, whatever. so they take T cells out into a, a well, yeah, just and then they add anti-CD3 to, to activate them. Hmm? Why do we not want, the white one is without CD3? So the one with CD, without CD3 doesn't bind because it has the low affinity LFA. That's why they call it resting, right? That's a white Yes, one. yeah. So resting CTL has not been activated. It's a low of CD3. Yeah. And then they, to make sure that it really is the LFA binding to ICAMP, they have anti-LFA, so they block LFA and it can't bind. So even if you have an activated cell, it won't stick to the plate or they block um, ICAM and get that same, lose that same, that lose that binding. So they know that it's the LFA binding to ICAM that for, causes that. So that's important to know that um, that LFA ICAM is essential. Is, uh, not going to do it. Yes, yeah. So it's really important to know that that LFA ICAM binding is what allows them to get, to, to kind of stay close enough to that target cell to really uh, um, kill it. And so the two ways that they can induce apoptosis are either through the FAST pathway or the perforin granzyme pathway. And again, um, as we've, we've, we've kind of covered this before, signaling through FAST ligand um, on the T cell will bind to FAST. Let's say all of our cells express FAST. Um, some, you know, and some tumor cells can downregulate fast, so it's probably good that we have a second mechanism to kill through that. We'll punch holes with uh, perforins, we'll punch a hole in the cell, and then granzyme will enter the cell. And the granzyme itself doesn't kill the cell, it doesn't kill the cell from the inside, but what it does is it has, um, it will then, uh, can, um, it will drive an active form of bid. That bid will now cause release of cytochrome C from the mitochondria of that cell, and that cytochrome C now enters, it, it has um, caspase activity and will drive apoptosis. Um, fast fast ligand works through a different part of that same pathway, but will also um, ca cause an active form of bid to release cytochrome C or directly 
um, activate caspase um, 3 and also um, caspase 9. So you, the, the whole caspase um, apoptosis pathway is induced by both. So when uh, you have a question that says how does the CTL kill um, the cell, uh, the CTL induces apoptosis through either pathway, even through even though it sounds like the. That's the extrinsic thing. Yes. Yeah, my question is going to be about the difference, um, not mechanism, but the between the bath and the program and ground down pathways. Well, there's um, still studies being done to, 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 as to the effectiveness of both, but that would also depend on the level of. Uh, fast expression on this target cell. Um, also, um, so they're both they're both quite important. Um, I couldn't say as to which one's more important uh, because you can actually knock one or the other out and still get pretty efficient killing. Um, there are people that um, now, uh, granted, if you knock out um, fast. In, in the system or fast ligand in the system, you do have um, T cells that start to grow out of control because FAST is not only involved in killing target cells, but again, remember, FAST is involved in um, T cell uh, maturation. Um, FAST is one of the, the ways that T cells are kind of regulated themselves. So not only do T cells kill through FAST, FAST ligand, but they, they themselves can be regulated. So for example, tumor cells, um, sometimes have evolved to kind of secrete vesicles that have fast um, ligand on them. So T cells not only have fast ligand on them, they also have a fast receptor. And so um, those little, they call them little, kind of like landmines um, with fast ligand on them will actually bind to T cells and then activate them before they can even get to the tumor cell. So it, 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 it's a little more complicated than, than just that because it's so when you knock something out, it has more than that effect. But when we just look at, in a dish at CTL trying to kill a target cell, if you knock out perforin, you still kill, they st will still kill through the, the, um, the fast, fast ligand. If you knock out fast, fast ligand, they'll still kill through the perforin granzyme pathway. So it's hard to say really what's more important. And I don't think that that's really well um, understood. Um, so uh, how do they kill? They kill the, through the granzyme perforin mediated cytolysis, cytolysis. Um, when stimulated, CTLs release granules. So these perforin is the 65 kilodalton pore forming protein. Granzyme is a serine protease, um, both taken up by um, endocytic process and then punch holes in the membrane and induce apoptosis. So that's all you really need to know about um, the, the perforin granzyme process. Um, and then this is just highlighting what I was talking about. Um, so if I take a, a mouse, and so one of the ways we, we study this um, has been in, in these mixed MLRs where we mix uh, lymphocytes, we mix T cells from different mice. Can you explain why we call the H? So the mouse MHC molecules are called uh, MHC1 molecules or H2A or H2K. The, the K or the B is a different um, basically allele. These are different alleles of MHC. Remember when we were first talking about MHC molecules, that we all have different MA alleles of MHC molecules and that's, that diversity helps us to kind of protect us against pathogens but that in that same vein, my MHC molecules aren't presenting the same antigens as your MHC molecules, so now they become targets. So if, if I was to get your organ, I'm gonna target it. My T cells aren't gonna see that as self. They're gonna, so we, we can use this to, to easily study cytotoxicity, for example, and if we were to mix T cells from two different MHC expressing mice, yeah, so that's saying these are, Let's call these MHC B and MHC K, class one A, a B and K. So H two B, H two K is just MHC one B, MHC one K. In this case, we inactivated the T cells from this mouse. So we either irradiated them or treated them with mitomycin C, which is going to block their ability to um, become activated. 
uh, basically killing them, but they're still there. They're still expressing MHC antigen complexes. And so they can be a target for the lymphocytes from these guys. So when we co-culture them together, okay, these guys are going to kill these guys. And so they're going to be cited, they're going to have cytotoxic effects. Uh -huh. uh, so if you kill the lymphocytes, mm -hmm. so they still express H2K antigen? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we haven't, we haven't lysed the cell, we just made it so, for example, radiation, when we irradiate it, it's going to cause damage to the DNA so that that cell now cannot replicate. Oh, yeah, if I take the thymus, then I'm not going to have T cells. Um, and those, those are the guys we're, we're isolating as lymphocytes. So we mix those two lymphocytes together, and then we follow and look for um, killing. We look for release of, for example, you can, um, you can look and see how much killing occurs. And, and then we can do the same thing here. But here we've knocked out um, perforin. Okay, so in these we've knocked out perforin, and so let, so if we if we have um, normal uh, B and K alleles mixed together with um, B, they'll kill these target cells. So, let's so you just use the antibody against the K. What do you mean you mix together? So we just mix the cells together. So the cells are mixed together. These, these, that's basically like putting in, putting cells of two different, so you don't want to mix blood, for example. So that's why when we, when we have a blood transplant, right, we only get our red blood cells. And if you've ever worked in a blood bank, when we're giving people red blood cells, you have to irradiate that blood product. And that's because you have to irradiate the blood product because any leftover lymphocytes are going to do exactly what's being done in this plate. They're going to kill the other person's lymphocytes. You, you don't want that to happen. They'll also attack tissue, so you get this graft versus host. Um, How do you irradiate? Are you irradiating? Um, a cesium source. It's a, a it's a, iso, a radioactive isotope of cesium. Um, so um, all, all hospitals have a cesium source. Um, they you basically have this huge lead container that you put blood into a, a, um, a compartment and you open that compartment up to the cesium source for a certain amount of time depending on the half-life of that radiation source. That will basically make it so lymphocytes can no longer um, become active. They can't divide, they can't proliferate and so, and it doesn't do anything to red blood cells because what are red blood cells missing? Nucleus. Nucleus. They don't have DNA. So what's being damaged by that radiation is majorly the DNA. Those red blood cells still function perfectly well when we irradiate them, but luckily lymphocytes don't. So we irradiate blood products when we give them to people because we don't want this to happen. Um, that's also why when you, uh, uh, when they give blood, they'll take that blood product and they spin it down and they get off the different components because you don't want to give buffy coat to patient, or, or you know, you don't want to um, have lots of lymphocytes in there. So blood testing means mm -hmm. But you, we also um, isolate pl um, platelets, for example, you, so you can get platelets and give those um, common, platelets are a common factor to give to um, cancer patients that have undergone chemotherapy or irradiation therapies. Um, you give them platelets because they start to bleed out because they're not making they enough. But you still have to radiate them. Yes, exactly. Yep. Um, the only case where you wouldn't want to radiate something is if you were doing an immune therapy where you wanted T cells to actually function as T cells. Um, and but that in that case, you would often be taking the patient's own blood product and giving it back to them. You wouldn't be taking somebody else's blood product and giving it back to that patient. So, so the T cell, you, you have to use your own? Yeah. Oh, yeah. From bone marrow? Um, no, you can collect it from blood. Yeah, T cells are, are really abundant in the blood, so you can, you can collect them from blood. You don't have to do a bone marrow. Um, so here we can see that uh, if we mix these guys together, even if you knock out uh, perforin, um, you still kill 
um, it's only when you knock out both perforin and um, and FAS. So if I block FAS, and the binding of FAS-FAS ligand, and I knock out perforin, then the cells will survive, and only then. So we know two things here. We know that you, both mechanisms kill, and but I know if I block both mechanisms, now I don't get killing. And so we can kind of, from this and from further experiments, we have figured that T cells, this is the only two ways they kill, but they do kill through both of these potential pathways. And they probably evolved to have these two pathways because um, it's better to have an alternative in case, for example, you downregulate fast. And that's where the next, um, that's where NKs come in because another thing that tumor cells do and virally infected cells do is they say, okay, fine, you caught me. I'm making lots of antigen and presenting them via MHC class one, so screw it. I don't need MHC class one for anything. I'll downregulate MHC class one. I don't need class one. So they downregulate. So virally infected cells will just, the, the, those that survive have very low levels of MHC class one. So they can kind of sneak under the radar and, and avoid being detected by cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So we've evolved very early on to have these natural killer cells to go around and say, okay, fine. What, who, who of you out there does not have MHC class one because I'm going to kill you? So basically, uh, if a cell has lots of MHC class one and antigen, then a CTL can target him, or CD8. But if he downregulates that now, the NK cell can come in. So the, the, the NK cells are actually receive a negative signal from MHC class one. But if that MHC class one isn't there, then they will kill, kill that cell. So um, NK cells make up five to 10% of circulation, so circulating. They keep a negative signal from uh, MHC class one. They know they are hiding something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So they lack specific antigen receptors, so they don't have TCRs. Um, they do remember, they do have FC receptors, so they can bind and cause antibody-directed um, cell-mediated cytotoxicity. But the other thing they do is then they, they look for cells that don't have MHC class one. Um, and so they help regulate innate adaptive immunity by cytokine secretion. They recognize and destroy pathogen infected cells and abnormal tumor cells. So both of these tend to downregulate MHC class one. And, but they do also respond very quickly, proliferate earlier in infections than CTLs um, because they're not reliant on um, what do CTLs need? CTLs need, they're naive, they need to go to the lymph nodes, they need to get activated by an APC. NK cells, they're not, they're not um, as picky. Um, they're looking for cells that are downregulated down MHC or happen to already be bound to antibodies and it will um, kill them through the same mechanisms that cytotoxic T cells did. Um, so what's the phenotype of NK cells? They're these lymphoid cells derived from um, these um, precursor lymphocyte, these lymphocyte precursors in the bone marrow. Uh, they do not require, uh, they are not, they don't evolve in the thymus. Um, they do not undergo receptor gene rearrangement. So again, remember they don't have a TCR. These aren't NKT cells, these are just NK cells. Um, NK cell, an NK, typical NK marker is this NK 1.1, but that's only in mice. Um, human, human uh, CD56 would be one of the major markers that would help us differentiate them. Because you, and you need those markers, because again, like I said, they look just like, if we're looking at them, they look just like lymphocytes. Um, defining trait is expression of a set of activating and inhibiting. How do you usually look like lymphocytes? Mm -hmm. How do you distinguish? Oh, by markers. Uh, well, one, they don't, they're not going to be CD3 positive. They don't have T cell receptors. So they're not going to stain for CD4. They're not going to stain for CD8. So they kind of, um, they do look different in expression, what they express, but they um, phenotypically look the same um, as these cells under the microscope. Um, but they do have these activating and inhibiting NK receptors. And so these work in conjunction looking at MHC. 
and looking at um, getting activation signals because um, it's a little more a little more complicated than just not having MHC. Um, tissues that are stressed will upregulate the positive receptor. Um, we all have, on all of our cells, we have that positive receptor and it's kind of upregulated when your cells are stressed. And they tend to be stressed when they are um, infected with the virus. They tend to be stressed when they are um, tumorigenic. So um, that helps to also kind of have a balance to where I have more positive signal. If I downregulate MHC class one, I have less negative signal, and that tells me to kill that cell. Um, NK cells, and I did say that NK cells don't have the same type of naive status as T cells, but they do have what is called licensing. Um, let's see, do I do I get into licensing? Um, so uh, we'll get into that next slide, I think. Um, so NK cells will, they have a positive signal, and again, this positive signal binds to the ligand on them and will activate them to kill the cell. Uh, the negative signal is through MHC class one. So if you have MHC class one expressed at high levels on a cell, you're not gonna get targeted by that NK cell. Now, when you lose MHC class one, and these cells are also um, stressed, they're gonna upregulate this positive ligand, and so you're gonna get killing um, through that NK cell. Um, what are some of the receptors on the NK cell itself? Again, we have some positive um, receptors. These are lectin-like receptors. Um, their ligands are, and so we have here um, activating or inhibiting these are mostly activating. Um, these are mostly activating these um, natural cytotoxic receptors, NCRs, or the NKG2Ds. Um, and again, these are also these receptors are also ways to, to identify NK cells. Um, but then we have these negative um, inhibitory molecules that bind to MHC class one. Um, and will send a negative signal. So these are the kind of the markers. We have two positive and two negative markers that are typically on um, NK cells. And I'm gonna run through this and you guys can look at these cells, these slides on your own. Um, so they uh, recognize and kill infected cells and tumor cells by the absence of MHC class one. Um, and how do they induce apoptosis? Just like CTLs. So you could go back to that CTL slide and say they kill through fast fast ligand and through perforin and granzyme. Um, the licensing. So even though they don't have this naive where they have to see um, antigen by, presented by an antigen presenting cell, uh, they do have this licensing. Um, they don't automatically kill. Um, they have to have a prior interaction with a cell that has normal levels of MHC class one. And the way I like to think about this is um, this is kind of the NK cells way of calibrating. Calibrating and saying this is what normal MHC class one looks like. So I've come into contact with, with cells that are not infected with the virus and I bound to those cells. I received a negative signal and I did not kill these cells. Okay, so I've set my threshold. Now, any MHC I see now after this that is lower than this, I'm gonna kill it. So, in a, everybody's different. We might even have some cells that express more MHC than other cells. Um, all cells are different, again, in what they're presenting. So every environment's gonna be a little different. So these have to have be licensed in, a, in an area. These go into the area, they kind of look through that area. The majority of the cells are probably not gonna be infected. They kind of get their, their threshold. Where's M, what's MHC look like in this area? Okay, it looks like about this level. That's the level of signaling that I get that will keep me from killing a cell. If I see somebody lower than this, now I'm gonna kill them. And and that's just talking about the affinity of the, that, the bond? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so we don't 100% understand licensing, but we do know that it is necessary. Licensing is just the goal, you know, that's a, that's a normal value, you, if you are below, you get a kill. It's yeah, like it kind of sets it like that. It's kind of like a threshold. It, and it, it's a, kind of the safety mechanism are to make sure that NK cells. Are so smart about that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but the, that's how I kind of picture it. It's like if you have, 
um, you have to calibrate your instruments. You have to know what is my threshold. And so these cells are doing that throughout the body. They're calibrate, kind of calibrating. Purposely going to a healthy cell. Yeah. First. Yeah. Well, and, and, and they're kind of rolling around, and their receptors are coming in contact with things. They have to come in contact with that health, healthy cell, not have killed that healthy cell, and then they've become licensed to now anything below those levels. Now I'm going to signal to kill. Do they, do they create that threshold with just the first cell that they come in contact with, or um, is it like... They're hitting a bunch of like uh, threshold points to kind of. Like I, I don't know, and that's why I wrote still in theory of okay. active <laughs> research. I don't know that those are great questions. If you want to go, there are lots of people that do NK cell research because it is a really interesting thing that we just don't understand. And they are very important. If you don't have NK cells, you have lots of infections. NK cells, even though they're not part of the adaptive immune response, are very helpful in, in that response. So they are really important cells. Um, okay. So, uh, natural killer cells recognizing uh, the absence of MHC class one. Um, there is some. Don't worry about this slide. There is some evidence of memory cells. How do you have memory? Um, th that that's just uh, something that anecdotally people think that they may produce memory cells, but. Um, um, and then NKT cells are the last ones we're covering. NKT cells are kind of this bridge between innate and adaptive. Remember NKT cells. So they are look like NK cells. They look like T cells. They have um, a T cell receptor. That T cell receptor is more of an innate type of T cell receptor because there's not a lot of variety in what it is. It's an invariant T cell receptor. And it's specific to factors that are um, known pathogenic factors, and um, it kills through fast fast ligand, not through per it doesn't have perforin and granzymes. So, um, and uh, it has both CD4 positive and CD4 negative cell types. Um, they don't form memory cells. So that's all you need to know about NKT cells. Um, and again, um, the last three I believe slides are just going over three um, techniques for studying um, cytotoxicity. Um, one is this, and we kind of saw this, co-culturing co T-cells with foreign cells um, called this mixed lymphocyte reaction. And here we're looking at, so we're taking, again, this is just what we did. We mixed lymphocytes from two different strains of mice, and then we're going to look at the killing. Um, and how we do that is we will usually take a, um, isot a radioactive isotope of, of, of hydrogen, H3, tritiated thymidine, um, and we mix that in that gets integrated into the DNA. Then when these cells die, um, they release that tritiated thymine, so your your level your um, radiation goes down. So we d then we calculate radiation based on how many cells got killed. And um, here, zero, one, and two, um, we're actually looking at MHC, comparing MHC of very related MHC alleles to a little different MHC alleles, very different. You can see you still get killing even when you have two different strains that are very similar to each other in, in MHC because um, they're going to make different proteins as well. Even though their MHCs are almost identical, there are probably have a few other genes that are different um, alleles and so expressing different antigens. But very little, and this kind of uh, um, kind of is where we came up with the whole idea that, well, uh, if we, we're going to MHC match people for donors because obviously I want to get this kidney or this whatever organ and I don't want this organ. And so this is why we kind of MHC match people because you don't want somebody who's very different in MHC than you because um, you're, your cells or their cells are going to kill each other. Um, other assay we have is this um, uh, CTL assays or cytotoxic lymphocyte activity can be demonstrated by cell mediated lymph lympholysis or, or CTL activity. Um, and here we'll have chromium 51 is taken up by cells and released when they, they, they are killed. So again, you're looking for release if cells are killed and if they're not killed, they don't release. Just another assay. And then uh, graft versus host reaction. 
um, is another thing we've been able to study these reactions, whereas you'll take screen, skin grafts um, from one mouse to another and look at rejection or, or even look at um, a graft versus host um, to see if, if you're getting a, a response from those lymphocytes that you transferred against the host. Um, so it's, it, these are just different techniques to study this and you guys don't really um, it's good to understand them so that if you, they come up in one of the questions, you kind of understand how they're done. But other than that, um, so that's pretty much the effector functions of the majority of our adaptive immune response. And next, on Monday, we're going to go over the immune response in space and time. So the, the, the Doctor Who lecture, I guess. Um, but uh, it's really, this, that's a chapter, the next chapter is a chapter that um, really is kind of a, a more new uh, and nuanced um, look at the immune response and it's really important again um, in when we're actually applying things like vaccines um, to know um, this because we've actually found that location's important even though when we were looking at this mouse model you could find cytotoxic T cells everywhere um, certain tumor therapies, we found that if you actually give the thera therapy locally, it will work. If you don't give it locally, it won't work. Um, timing is very important in vaccination. Um, so all of these, these factors are really important to understand. So that's next week.